You are listening to the Dare to Love podcast with your hosts, Sonica Tinker and Christian Peterson, founders of LoveWorks. Hi, and welcome to the Dare to Love podcast. This is Christian Peterson, and I'm excited to be with you today. I want to start today's episode with a quote, a rather stunning quote from a book. I'll tell you where it came from in a moment. It goes like this, quote, Men, you have the power to make or break a relationship. That's right. Research shows that what men do in a relationship is, by a large margin, the crucial factor that separates a great relationship from a failed one. This does not mean that a woman does not need to do her part, but the data proves that a man's actions are the key variable that determines whether a relationship succeeds or fails, which is ironic since most relationship books are written for women. Unquote. And I'll just repeat one crucial phrase here. The data proves that a man's actions are the key variable that determines whether a relationship succeeds or fails. Today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about men in relationship, men and relationship, how men show up, uh, how they show up powerfully or not so much, and what the, what the effects are when a man shows up powerfully in relationship and when he doesn't, and what can be done to do it better. The quote you just heard is from a newer book written by John Gottman and some of his co-authors. And for those of you who don't know, John Gottman is maybe the most famous relationship researcher in the world. And as far as I know, he is the, he is the professional who has come the closest to make the sometimes nebulous field of intimate relationships into solid science. He was, he was made famous when he, through a study in his love laboratory, was able to predict with 94% accuracy which couples would stay together and which would split up. So one of his famous books is called Why Marriages Succeed or Fail. The book I just quoted from is called The Man's Guide to Women from 2016. I am recording this episode uh, as I'm gearing up for a small private retreat I do for men called Power and Heart where men get to explore how to express their masculine power in their relationships and lives, and where men get to discover what their personal version of being a powerful man looks like, not what society or Hollywood or their partners say says a powerful man looks like, but what they want it to look like. And I'll post a link in the description for anyone who want to know more about that. But in preparing for this retreat, I am talking to men and women about what it means to be what it means for a man to show up powerfully in a relationship and about what happens when he does and what happens when he doesn't. And because we have seen thousands of men and women, couples and individuals, both in individual coaching and the workshops we lead, uh, we being my wife and business partner Sonica and myself, we have a lot of insight into men's relationships insights about what works well and what doesn't work and what can be done differently by men and women to make things better. My intention with this podcast episode is to support my fellow brothers out there to have an experience of being powerful and confident and open both in life in general but in intimate relationships in particular. It's also my intention that this episode helps those who are in relationship with men, whether you're wives, girlfriends, husbands, partners, or some, somebody else in relationship with a man, to better understand why their men do what they do and how they can m- more have more loving, satisfying relationships with the men in their lives. And ultimately, my intention here is for all of us to have more success and satisfaction and love and harmony in our relationships because... Personally, this has been true in my life that my intimate relationships and my relationship with my family mean everything. So, and, and when they don't function, there's a, there's a very uh, steep price to pay. So, I know we're all unique human beings, okay? But based on my experience, there are near universal complaints that we hear from partners about their men. And there are near universal complaints that men have about their partners. Some of them are the very typical complaints we hear about men is something like, he's just not there for me. I don't feel safe. I can't trust him. He never connects. Some of the primary complaints we hear from men is something like, it doesn't matter what I do. I can't win. 
she's never happy. She's impossible to make happy. It reminds me of a man, uh, of a man who, um, who once told me, he said, I feel like a second-rate citizen in my own house. And I thought, man, ouch, that no one should have that experience, wh- whoever they are. And this was this man who was talking was he was a classic Mr. Nice guy who works hard, provides, works some more, gets a promotion to keep up with, you know, the increasing costs of providing a nicer and nicer life that he provides for his wife and kids to enjoy. But somehow his wife never feels that he gives anything important. And his solution is just to keep accommodating, keep saying, I'm sorry about that, I'll try harder. And then he tries to work hard and provide more and work harder. But in the end, no one gets what they want. Today, I'm going to be talking about three different sections that I hope will be really useful for you. The first section, I'm going to talk about some of the things that happen when a man has a hard time finding his power in relationship. You could you could say these are some of the symptoms of a man who isn't really in his power and has a hard time getting what he wants in relationship. So these are some of the problems that we see. Secondly, I want to talk about what a man himself can do to stay in his power and to get what he wants in his intimate relationships. And third, I want to give some uh, tips and advice about what a man's partner, whether you're a wife or girlfriend or husband, a boyfriend, a partner, what you can do to help your man out. And then if there's time, I'll take a few questions that have come in from uh, Facebook or email that people would have would like to have included in this podcast. And before I jump into that, I want to give a quick word about how we might define power or what it means to be a powerful man. Um, a recent definition I heard states that a man who owns his shadows as well as his gifts, who is accountable for his actions, and who keeps his agreements and promises, that is a man in his power. And I really like that definition as a general application for life. Now, when it comes to relationships, there are certain qualities, I would add, that characterizes a powerful man. So a powerful man is someone who can be present with what is happening in the moment. Someone who can be honest and open about what he needs and wants. Someone who has the courage and the skill to create what he wants together with his partner or family. Someone who knows and expresses the full range of his emotional life. And finally, someone who can own, I call it, who can own his radiance, who can embody his sexuality, who has aliveness and fire inside. And another thing I would say characterizes a powerful man is that he holds certain beliefs about himself. For example, that if I, you know, if I'm a powerful man, I would believe some version of these about myself that my wants and needs are okay. I would believe that I am going to get what I want. And you might add in parentheses here, I'm going to get what I want, not at anyone else's expense, but I'm going to figure out how to get what I want in a way that works for everybody. I would believe that I am worth being loved and appreciated and seen for who I am. And I would believe that my masculine force, which includes specifically my sex drive, are natural and good forces. All right, so let's jump into one of the three main sections I want to share in this podcast. And this section is the one about, you could call it symptoms. Some of the stuff that happens when a man has a hard time finding his power or finding his solid footing in relationship. And if you're a man listening to this, you can see if you relate to this. When you experience any of these, these are signs to you that there's work to be done and that you have landed in a place where you're probably not in your power or have given up some of your power. So here goes. Number one, you hate it when your wife, girlfriend, partner gets upset and emotional about something, especially when it's about you or something you did or said. 
When this happens and she gets emotional or loud or intense about something, you just want to get the hell out of there or make it stop or fix it. And that last little point or fix it um, goes with a question I got from Facebook from Robert who said, what's, what's behind men's urge to come up with a quick fix or a quick resolution when you know any sort of conflict rears its head in relationship or when their partner says you know anything that could be judged as they're not be them not being happy or satisfied right now what's behind that urge and i think what's behind this urge is that we as men are afraid of the emotionality of our partners. In this case, I'll just speak as a, as if we have a female partner here that, you know, we, we get afraid when emotionally it gets intense. I think part of that is simply due to the fact that we're not very trained or used to embodying, a, you know, a full range of emotions. Certainly there's part of that of just having many of us have been systematically trained away from by our parents and teachers of feeling anything that had any sort of volume or intensity to it. I know that was true in my household. You know, everybody was very measured and uh, there were never any like high emotions of any kind. Not much, you know, no loud anger, no loud joy, not intense sadness. It just wasn't much part of my upbringing, and I'm pretty sure that has been true for a lot of men. Um, so basically, we get afraid of the emotionality. We feel so uncomfortable with it that instead of just being with it or learning how to be with it, we just want it to go away. And in our minds, how that happens is if I provide you a fix, then you can take care of it and we can be done with it and we can come back to this, uh, you know, my normal equilibrium. So pay attention to this. When your wife or partner gets emotional or what you think is emotional about something, notice your own discomfort rise in you. And <clears throat> we'll get to the section about what you can do instead. But for now, just notice that. Second point, you don't dare to share your own vulnerability, your fears or your insecurities. Um, you might have those conversations in your mind. Sometimes you have conversations with other men in your in your world. You know, I know I, I too am I'm an active an active participant in men's work and have been for many years. So I get to sit in groups of many kinds of men, and it is an often heard sentiment that we can share, have learned to share freely with our male brothers, but lots of men don't do that at home with their wives or wives or girlfriends or partners. So Notice when you hold yourself back and you catch yourself not saying something that you feel something that you're not proud of because you think it's uncool or it'll have you look weak or you just don't, whether you know why or not, just notice when you don't do this. Often your partner, by the way, will be very aware, sometimes even more aware than you are of when this happens. You know, this, I can't tell you how many times I've had that experience where I will say, to Sonic, I'll say, you know, I'm fine. No, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. And she just knows that that is not accurate. She just knows and feels that something is cooking in here in me that I'm not saying. And I have now learned to do something different, but it took me many, many years to get to a point where I would freely share the things I was not proud of. Um, you know, the uncool feelings in very large quotation signs here. So that's the second point. Third point is when you find yourself saying yes when you really mean no, or for that matter, no when you really wanted to say yes. In other words, you, you bend too much away from your own knowing of what is right and what is true and what you want to do and what you should be doing. Now, I want to say there's, there's a lot of good stuff to be said about being flexible and being able to meet halfway and to not get attached to any one thing. All that is true. And notice if you find yourself saying yes when you really mean no, because it's a classic symptom of not daring to stand in your own power or not knowing where to stand in a way that respects yourself. Because the thing that happens when you bend too much, 
when you say yes too many times when you really mean no, or no too many times when you kind of want it to say yes, is you end up sowing distrust about your own word to yourself. It's a whole other matter. You know, there's all kinds of stuff that happens in relationship to your partner about this, but just even take your partner out of the equation. When you keep doing this too much, you end up distrusting your own word. And that is a that's just that's a very undesirable situation for a man and it erodes your power like crazy. Number four. It goes a little bit with number one here, I'll say, but I'll still say it because uh, it bears somewhat repeating. You simply avoid engaging with your partner about anything that's emotional or tr potentially triggering. So you don't talk, you check out, you find you know reasons to be elsewhere, you stay too busy with your work, your projects, your phone, your computer, your sports, porn, you, you name it. You go elsewhere where it's easier to handle the emotional side of what is going on. So notice the key thing to notice is that you simply avoid engaging in these kinds of conversations. And often how you know this is you'll end up having a partner who is constantly on you for talking about this or that, who is constantly pulling on you for can we deal with this? Can we deal with that? That's the easiest way to know that you have landed in this um, trouble. Fifth point. You don't speak your truth. You feel it's not safe to speak your truth. You feel it won't be received if you speak your truth. So you feel you can't say what's really on your mind. You don't want to, maybe you don't want to hurt her or you don't want to cause another blow up. So you end up keeping it to yourself. But the main point here being is you don't speak your truth. And that too has you questioning your internal knowing. You know, you can call that intuition, heart, gut feeling, higher guidance, whatever sounds better to you. Um, you can't really trust that. And another thing, another way you know this is the case is when you're constantly weighing in your mind, okay, should I say this? Or And then you're like, no, you know, I don't think it's worth it because it's going to... It's going to best be, end up being a half hour conversation and then we're probably going to get nowhere. And you know, when you end up having that kind of considerations in your mind a lot, that's when you know you're in the place where you don't feel either safe or comfortable or invited to speak your own truth. And that too is a way to lose footing or lose power in a pretty serious man, in a pretty serious fashion. Uh, I want to go back a little to the piece I said about um, in the first piece I said, number one, that you hate it when your partner gets really emotional. Uh, a subset of that first point is that you're afraid of her getting angry at you. Sometimes, by the way, that includes being afraid of your own getting angry. It's a subset of being uncomfortable with intense emotions of any kind. I, uh, we once had a man in our, <clears throat> excuse me, a man in our workshops who said, you know, you can give me a gang of thieves or thugs anytime and I know how to fight them and stand up. But when my wife, who's five foot one and a hundred pounds, when she gets mad, I'm ready to crumble. I'm ready to run. And I, th I think, you know, I don't, I don't have the scientific proof for this, but I think there's something to the fact that men in general, and I'm aware, by the way, I didn't say this in the beginning, so I'll just insert it right here, that I know when I'm talking about men and women and what men do or don't do or men like or don't like, I know that I'm generalizing, okay? I'm well aware that in generalizing, that does not capture everybody. So everything I say, it doesn't mean that everything, you're, that you're going to relate to everything. And sometimes when you're listening to this as a man or a woman, you'll find that what I'm saying pertains to a man will pertain exactly to you as a woman. There's a lot of this stuff that's exactly opposite. And we have talked to hundreds, uh, probably thousands at this point of men and women. So we do have some backing for what we're saying here. So back to the sub point about um, being uncomfortable with intense emotion and particularly anger in this case, hers or your own. If you find yourself doing pretty much anything you can to avoid her getting angry at you. 
sometimes you might, if you have good awareness, you might notice sometimes that you're, whenever she gets angry at you, you feel like a five-year-old kid again being scolded by your mom. That is such an example. And uh, I probably don't need to say that. But when, when you land in a situation where, you know, it feels like you're a five-year-old boy and your wife is your mom, that is not a good situation for the power balance or the power dynamics in your relationship. So pay attention to the times where you are scared of her getting angry at you and hearing your name in her sentences. Uh, the next point I want to say is you try to, you can say this is like, this is also a symptom of not being balanced in your power, but it's like the overcompensation portion of it is when you try to dominate her either with your logic and reason or with your physicality or your loudness. Some oftentimes we've heard, we've had many women will come tell us this, that they, you know, they feel completely discounted for their way of processing information and emotion. I too have been guilty of this many times in my life of, you know, I'm having a conversation based on my way of processing information and my personal way as a man and as a pretty analytical person, how I process information is in an analytical fashion. I try to make logic sense out of everything much more than I try to feel my way through something. Uh, a good illustration is how you could just see how the difference between how I or my wife Sonica generally move in life. I have much, I like it much better when I have a certain plan for how I'm moving forward with anything. It doesn't matter. It could be as simple as mowing the lawn or it could be creating a giant business project. It really doesn't matter. I feel really good when I have an exact plan laid out for me that I can logically walk my way through. Sonica is much more comfortable with and skilled in feeling her way through things. She just feels something out and intuitively somehow knows that, okay, this is the next step we're doing and this is the next step we're doing and this is the next step we're doing. Often I have been in the situation and as I know have many other men and I'm inviting you to pay attention to if you ever do this. Uh, like trying to win an argument simply by saying, well, I'm right because it's obvious that it's logical what I'm saying. And you don't really have a good reason. You're just saying that you have a feeling about it. So obviously that what I'm saying is more valid. Be really mindful of landing in that trap. Um, for one, it has your partner feel severely discounted. Secondly, it's, it assumes, it, ha it has a great arrogance in it, basically. Something I have been accused of many times in my life, and very often rightly so. It has a great arrogance in it to simply assume that my way of dealing with anything is by definition superior. And <clears throat> the extreme case of this, of course, is when you try to dominate physically. Uh, that could be anything from yelling, threatening, you know, with your physical posture to uh, outright violence. So if you catch yourself in any of those, you can know that is a way you have lost your powerful footing and you're trying to kind of overcompensate your way back to it. And the other side of that coin is the next point is when you uh, it bluntly, I'll say bluntly, you wimp out, you fold, you bend, you pretzel. You re resign yourself to your fate, or as it uh, sometimes is said in with an old Danish in my um, I'm from Denmark, in case you don't know that. Um, so that Danish is my first language. There's an expression there called a man who is under the slipper. And it's said about men who have no power at home. Uh, I guess here we would say something like uh, not the one wearing the pants or a doormat. So when you find yourself not standing up, this is true, of course, in your intimate relationships, as well as it is with your kids, as well as it is at your work. And how you know that you're not standing up when you really want to be standing up is you, you know, you get this little niggling voice in the back of your head that says, wow, you just wimped out there, man. You're you're weak. Sometimes my little voice in the back of my head will say I'm weak. And, you know, sometimes... Oftentimes, the voice in my head that says I'm weak is a nasty, shadowy voice that I am better off without. And it's, you know, it's kind of the voice of teachers or parents who called me bad things. But often, sometimes that voice is also a signal to myself that, you know, here was a chance for you to speak up 
and stand up and take a stand for something that's important to you and you didn't. So that's what I want you to pay attention to is when do you uh, not stand up for something that is in actuality important for you. Sometimes that is a typical way you'll see this is you don't stand up for what you want and need. It could be uh, quality time. It can be taking a vacation every year. It can be having uh, affection and sex or fun or adventure. You know, something that's really important to you and you find yourself saying, let's say your partner doesn't want to do what you want to do, whether it's camping or sex or anything in between, and, you're, and your response is always, yeah, all right, well, it doesn't matter. You know, how, how important is it? You know, you know, it's not like I'm it's not like I'm going to die or anything. I'll be fine. You know, when you catch yourself doing a whole bunch of I'll be fine. Oh, yeah. Right. It's really not that important. But after a while, you how you know that it really is important is you begin to feel resentful and irritated and you get too angry about things that in, in and of themselves aren't that important. So watch for wimping out or folding or bending or not going for what you want and not standing up for what it is that's important to you. Okay, now let's move to the next section. And this is the section where I want to talk about some of the things men can do, you as a man can do to stay in your power, to be in your power, which directly translates to getting more of what you want and having better relationships. So point number one, say what you want know what you want, own what you want, and actually speak it. Go for what you want. I know that might sound, some people say that, well, that sounds so simple, but I can't tell you how many people we hear from where, but this is true for both men and women, actually, uh, you end up after years of not getting what you want, feeling really resentful at your partner, whereupon further reflection, or when someone like us comes in and asks the right questions, you realize, well, you know, I'm just mad that I didn't get what I want, but come to think of it, I never actually really asked for what I wanted or told my partner what it is that's really important to me. So that is the first point that you can do, which is what a powerful person does, is own what you want and say what you want and go for what you want. And a part of this is is have, uh, you know, it, if you don't have them automatically or by nature, I certainly didn't by no means, is to develop the skills it takes to craft what it is you want, to create win-win situations in your relationship. That is so much better than, you know, just getting pissed off for not getting what you want. And of course, the other part of that is, is owning that it's okay to want what you want. You know, so if you notice that having cuddle time is really important to you, to actually dare to own that and go for that, that that's a real example from myself, actually, in my previous relationships. You know, I'd always, the only way I knew how to go for um, getting my physical needs and my needs and wants for intimacy and cuddle time, the only way that I thought was acceptable, that I knew how to go for that, was to have sex. So it was always like, it was sex or nothing. So if we didn't have sex, in my mind, it was nothing. And I could easily imagine my partners having had a feeling of always, of feeling pulled on for always having sex. But the truth was that often I would have been happy with just sleeping in the spoon position for a night or just laying my head on her chest or the other way around and that would have filled my heart up so much and helped my nervous system relax. But I never had the guts to own that and to ask for that because I thought it was unmanly and stupid and weak and ridiculous to want to just cuddle. I thought, okay, well, kids do that. Certainly not real men like me. So own that. Go for it. Next point is similar, but it's with the specific distinction of know and speak how you feel, the entire range of how you feel. So I can easily speak to this from experience too, you know, basically what I, as a young man, I, I figured that the only, pretty much the only acceptable feelings were feeling okay, 
happy, not too happy, you know, everything in measure, as we say in Denmark. Not too happy, but, you know, happy, content, and irritated. So it's, you know, a little bit of joy, a little bit of anger, but in measure. Those were pretty much the only uh, colors on my emotional palette. So you can imagine the, to stay with that metaphor, the pictures that I painted in metaphor were rather black and white or certainly not very colorful. So get in touch. I know this sounds simple and to some men this is old news, I'm aware. Um, I have been practicing this for many years, but you know, if you'd caught me when I was 30, it would have been a very big deal to me to even hear that. What do you mean know how you feel? What do you mean speak how you feel? I would have been shocked at a piece of advice like that. And I know this is still true because we interact with both couples and individuals who come to us and just don't know this yet, that it's whatever you feel is okay. It's okay to feel sad, joyful, angry, scared, all of it. It's okay. And yeah, there are ways to deal with all of it, but the main point is just feel it and own it and let it be okay. Thirdly, something you can do is to stay present with yourself and with a partner or with your kids. This is equally important with your kids is to stay present and engaged even when things get emotionally intense. Stay present, stay engaged. Or we had a trainer once, a coach once, who said, stay in the conversation. But I know it's not just staying in the conversation because I know from my own life that I have stayed in many conversations that I had emotionally and mentally checked out of a long time ago. My mouth was just doing the autopilot work. So the Really, the thing is to stay present with all my faculties, with an open heart, with my eyes wide open, with my ears wide open, with my body open. Even if things get intense, there is a, there's a big temptation, I believe, for us to shut down and defend ourselves when things emotionally get intense in front of us. So one of the very best things, so very best practices you can take on that I believe is a, definitely a hallmark of being in your power and accessing all the power that you naturally have is you stay present and engaged even when things get hot. Number four point, take space consciously and powerfully. So one, you know, one of the things you might have, if you're a man, you've probably been in a relationship where one of your strategies or one of the things you found yourself doing when conflicts arose or you got confused or angry about something is you want to take space. Or if you feel there's like too much intimacy or sometimes you don't even have a story for it. You just need to take some space and have some alone time. For one, I'm, I'm saying that's fine. I'm saying that's an okay need. It's a natural need. There's nothing bad or harmful about it. And it's cool that you want that. So when you want that, take the space consciously and powerfully. That means you don't have to have a big blow up. You don't have to make up some big excuse. You don't have to make up that, you know, I really have to finish this project for work tomorrow, so I'm going to sit in the office. Or you don't have to make up that, you know, if I don't get over to my friend at this and so-and-so time, he's going to get mad, so therefore I have to move. Like, just say it straight up. I need to have a little time to myself. I need a little space. And do it consciously without the uh, without the venom or without the huff and puff or without the shutdown. I will actually do this now. Even when I get triggered about something uh, or frustrated about something with Sonica, I will take my space consciously and powerfully by going up to her, even if I'm mad about something, and just looking her straight in the eyes and saying, hey, honey, I need to take a little time for myself. I'm not leaving you. I'm not running away from the relationship. And not to worry, I'll be back. I just need a little more time. I just need a little time to myself. So I'll be back, okay? I'll be out in the yard or in the garage or in the office or whatever. So take space consciously and powerfully. Number five. This is, um, I heard this quoted by, actually I read a Danish article that was written by a Danish uh, psychologist who was were talking about men in relationship and he said roughly translated be willing to take an interest in stuff that doesn't really interest you or in other words be willing to take an active interest in something that isn't your highest priority and the examples he gave was that still in this day even as far as we've come with 
having equal rights and sharing the work burden between men and women in our households. Even to this day, women are still the ones who, to a very large degree, are like the managers of our intimate relationships. This is not always the case. Granted, this is a de generalization for sure, but this psychologist, I I'm sorry I forgot his name, so I'm quoting from memory here, but it it's also in line with what we see that still to a very large degree, women are the ones predominantly taking care of the social calendar, the kids' calendar, the household calendar, the chores that need to be done, and men are the ones helping out. And that's the case even if both men and women have a full-time job outside the house, that predominantly women end up carrying that. And his, the point he was making was be willing to take an interest in stuff, something that isn't naturally on your radar. And it's okay if it's not naturally on your radar to have the house look nice or which dentist the kids go to. You know, I've had to learn that too. And I will say, by the way, still in our household, Sonica still manages m most of that. And we just are open and honest and clear about it. And there are other things I manage a whole bunch more of. But particularly, how, how you know this balance has gotten out of whack, the easiest way to know it is if you have a partner who gets really resentful that you're not doing X, Y, Z. And you have frequent arguments about who does what. That's how you know that the balance needs to be reset or fiddled with. And one of the things you can do to step yourself into a more powerful place is to simply say, I am going to make a declaration of saying, I am going to take an interest in so-and-so in our relationship. You know, our relationship as a whole is a good example of this. Um, it's a very common occurrence, even in this day where men are by far more relationally and emotionally conscious than we were excuse me, 30, 40, 50 years ago. There's no doubt about that, but it's still a very common occurrence that men will take not so much interest in the health or quality of their marriages or relationships until their partner says, I'm done. I want a divorce. I'm tired of this. And then all of a sudden, the man gets awoken to action needs to be taken. Another way I sometimes say this is that men, we tend to operate on an emergency principle with stuff that isn't on our highest priority list. So relationship is a good example. You know, I, I'll, as long as we're okay and nobody's uh, yelling too bad, I'm thinking we're fine. It's not until you come and say, oh, I want a divorce or I am sick of you. That's when I click into action. I'm like, okay, I definitely need to do something right now. So the point being is to jump into action before it gets so dire. And how you can make sure it doesn't even get that dire is you take an interest in something that might not be your primary interest. For example, the health of your relationship. And there are easy things you can do for that. You know, you can go, go find a book about relationship that you think sounds really interesting and share it with your partner. Or you take the initiative to come to a workshop like the one Sonic and I host or someone else in your area or someone else you trust or someone else you think could be fun. It doesn't have to be a specific relationship training, but it's really cool if it is because it sends a signal that you really do care about that. And in case you didn't know that, by the way, um, it's one of the one of the primary complaints women have about men in relationship is they don't care enough about relationship. And honestly, I, be, I don't believe that men don't care about relationship, but often it's not our primary interest. So we give our focus elsewhere. So in summary, be willing to take an active interest, even in things that aren't necessarily your highest priority already. Number six, make connection, intimate connection, a very high priority. Even if that's not something you normally think about much, make connection a priority. It's it's just good all around for everyone. And being con like there's two parts of it. There's the outward connection towards your partner. In the case of women, one of the I quoted from John Gottman in the beginning from one of his newer books called A Man's Guide to Women. And in case you don't know, John I, I mentioned that John Gottman and his team are probably the ones who've gotten the closest to making real 
hard data science out of relationships. And they have studied thousands of couples primarily, but also individuals in their love laboratory where they have broken down every facet of human behavior in relationship and, you know, coded and measured every aspect of human behavior in that setting. And the number one thing or one of the number one things that women consequently say as a complaint on, a, on, the, on the flip side, what they want is connection, intimacy and connection. So make that a priority. It's, it's just huge. So that's the, the one side of connection is the connection towards your partner. It means to show up. It means to share time. It means to say yes to each other's bids, which we cover elsewhere. It means joining each other's worlds here and there, doing something together. It means many things. But there's also a connection piece that's internal to you as a man. It's like for me to truly connect with my partner, I got to also be able to have some connection inwards to my heart, basically. It's a good, simple way to say that. Be connected to my heart, to what's important to me, to what I feel, to the part of me that also needs, like I mentioned in the beginning, for me, I, I, I totally need quality time and cuddling. I need that too, to just be okay with that and reach out for it and demonstrate it through my actions that I am reaching out to you to connect. Now, many ways to do it. Some of the ways I do, like little ways I do connection on an everyday basis is when Sonica, when I see Sonica come home, driving down the, up our driveway, I get out of my chair, put my computer away for a second, and I walk out to the driveway to greet her and see if I can carry her bags. That's a little piece of connection making. I call them touch points. That's a little touch point. It basically says, I care about you. I love you. I'm glad to see you. I noticed that you're here. I make meals for her. I make sure to come up and give her a little shoulder rub when she's sitting working at her computer. I make sure we have lovemaking, even if we sometimes are tired. And, you know, I make sure it, we, it doesn't get forgotten, even in the times where we get stressed out or there's a ton of work. Many ways to do that. Point being, make your connection a priority. Seventh point here, and there's one more, is keep your promises. Do what you say you will do. Show up how and where and when you say you will show up. Integrity. Again, going back to, interestingly, the John Gottman book I was just referencing, the number one thing that the women, they, the thousands of women they have interviewed say that they want is trustworthiness. How you demonstrate trustworthiness is pretty simple. You do what you say you will do. You show up how, when, and where you say you will show up. And when you're unable to do so, you clean it up consciously. You don't try to explain it away or defend it away or pretend it didn't happen. You just own up to it and you clean it up in a good way. Also stuff we teach elsewhere. But I can't stress enough how important it is to show up in integrity is how I often think about it. Because every time you don't, it raises this little flag or sets off this little alarm in the back of your partner's mind that says, okay, maybe it wasn't a big thing now. But when it really counts, will he be there? If something serious happens, will he really be there? And when that happens many times, your word gets eroded. She loses respect and trust in you. And you also end up losing respect and trust in yourself if you do this over and over again. And then the last thing I'll say, number eight point here for what you can do to get more of what you want and to also own your own power is to connect your heart to your sex. Now, there's kind of two parts of this. One of them have I already said was one of, was the first one I the first point I mentioned here is own your desires, own what you need. For most men, sex is part of that. I need and want to have sexual interaction, physical touch. I love it. It's important to me. So, for one, own that that's the case. And connect your heart to it. On the flip side of that, for women, one of the things they often will say, women will often say, is it's not that they don't want to have sex, it's that they want it to be more connected and intimate. How do we make it more connected and intimate? Um, and what you can do to that end is you connect up your heart 
to your sex. You can you can even imagine the you can imagine the representation of that is like an open highway between your heart and your genitals. But it's of course more than just the picture of it, although that's a useful picture. One of the ways I have demonstrated this and I have practiced this with Sonica is is to allow myself to cry when having sex as an example that is an example of having my heart involved in the sexual act that never used to happen like if you had talked to me when i was 30 or 25 that would have been the worst thing i'd ever heard i couldn't have thought of anything more humiliating or awful than to cry in the middle of sex but i totally do that now sometimes it's because i'm afraid of something else in life Sometimes it's because I'm moved to tears by the beauty and pleasure of what we're engaged in or any number of other reasons. But it's just an example. Is to let yourself be both, you know, wild man roar. I want you. Let's do it. And to bring in the softness of caress and touch and wanting to please your partner in the deepest possible way and to feel you'll know when you're there and you might know when you're not there although i'm not sure i would have known that i wasn't there when uh, in my younger days but you'll know when you're there and you can feel emotionally the sex you're enjoying through your physical touch and your genitals and i promise you it'll help to balance out the power of your sex drive to connect it to your heart it transforms it from just being this absolutely physical need that just needs to be taken care of to something that fills your whole being your heart as well and you as a human being as a man all right so i'm i am noticing in my uh, podcast runtime here that we are approaching the 50 minute mark here and i still have lots more to say about this so i am just right now making the uh, executive decision that i am going to make a part two of this podcast i just think it'll make it a little easier easier on you the listener um that we break it up a little bit and that we don't go past the hour mark that's always our desire not to go past the hour mark um so i will make a part two of this podcast and what i will be covering in the part two is what what a man's partner can do to help him be in his power and to create more harmonious relationships and there's lots to say about that and i also have more questions from uh that have come in through facebook or emails that um People have said they would like me to talk about in a podcast about men and relationship. And there are some pretty juicy questions in here. And this will also give time to get some more questions. So if you or anyone you know have more questions, feel free to shoot an email to christian at loveworksforyou.com. Or you can always find our uh, use the contact tab on our website, loveworksforyou.com. And um, yeah, I will get this out and then we will get out of part two and... I just want to say thank you so much for listening and thank you for being interested in this material and thank you for some being someone who wants to be a more powerful, balanced, grounded, loving man or thank you for wanting to help the men in your world and in your relationships be men like that. Thank you so much. I look forward to chatting with you next time. Until then, take care. You have been listening to the Dare to Love podcast with Sonica Tinker and Christian Peterson, co-founders of LoveWorks. And hey, if you found this podcast to be valuable, would you hit the share button and go ahead and share this with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, or wherever your favorite hangouts are. Thanks so much for sharing the love.